Once again, I bring you another guest to Alas Kuro Negro's party. Do not forget that this is a platform to be educated on maybe the taboos of what sex may bring to you, or maybe those trending topics, and obviously those conversations that we have with all of our friends. But today, I have the pleasure of bringing you a speaker, a writer, a coach of the mental health and sexuality. The pleasure of introducing to you Nina Kudney. How you doing, girl? <laughs> Good. How are you? What an intro. I love it. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So, um, listen, um, Nina. So, first, um, talk to a little about yourself and you know who you are, what you do, um, and then we'll dive into these myth of the fem uh, female sexuality. And I have a, actually, actually, I have a few things that I want to clear. Because, you know, I've, I've been debating whether they're true or not. So okay. before we get into that, before we get into that, before we get into that, you know, who are you? What are you doing? Um, tell me a little about yourself. Sure. Um, so I, like you said, I, I'm a writer and speaker on all things sex and mental health. And I'm also a certified sex coach. And it's, fun, it's funny because people, when they think of a sex coach, they're like, wait, so... In the bedroom? You know, <laughs> You know, are you like the, the referee? No, that, that's a foul. That's a foul. Penalty on that play. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. They, I have literally been asked, like, so you're going to, like, come into our, I'm like, no, no, no. All I, because what I do, I can do anywhere. So it's always telephonic. Um, and I feel like a lot of times people appreciate that because they're uncomfortable, right? I mean, the thought of speaking to somebody in person about their sex life is difficult for a lot of people, you know, um, over the phone, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so that's what I do. I do some freelance writing um, for uh, sexuality blogs, mental health marketing companies. So if it has to do with sex or mental health, that's, that's me. Um, I am married and I have two kids. So I also know that side of sexuality. Um, so, you know, so yeah, that's what I do. All right. So, and, and hold up. I, this, and this, might, this is, might be a personal question, right? How does you, you know, being a, a sexuality coach have an impact on your marriage? And what do I mean by that, right? Like, do you like almost um, uh, evaluate yourself? Like, you know, like, since you know, like, you know, like, do you evaluate yourself while you're in your marriage? Like, and how, and you know, how does, how does your husband take that? That's a great question. Um, so it's, it's funny. I had someone said to me once when I said, oh, I'm a certified sex coach. And they're like, oh my gosh. So you probably have like the perfect sex life with your husband. I was like, <laughs> uh, no, I'm also human and I'm married with two kids. Like what? You know? So I always tell people, I don't have a perfect sex life or a perfect anything. That's why I can relate and help other people. So, you know, that's, that's something that, um, you know, I said, as a sex coach, I feel like, you know, I think I'm just more open. And yeah, I do evaluate stuff probably more. I'm much more in tune with what's going on. And as far as how it impacts my husband, um, I, I think that, the biggest question I get is, do your, does your husband mind that you speak to a lot of men? Like I, I have clients of all genders, right? But I do find that I speak a lot to men because I don't think men in our society are really allowed to be vulnerable about their sexuality, you know, right? So like they don't ever have any erection issues. They don't, they're in the mood all the time. They can last forever. Everything's perfect. They can get horny, no problem. That's what's supposed to be talked about and that i mean men aren't robots right so i think a lot of times men feel comfortable because i'm i'm not a threat like i'm not their partner but i'm a female so they can get they can have this really vulnerable conversation with me and not worry about being rejected or judged i'm not their partner so they can be honest and open about stuff that's really hard to be open and honest about as a guy in our culture so that question I get, like, does your husband mind that you talk to a lot of guys about sex? I was like, no, you know, and, 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 I, and it does take a, a confident man to be my partner. It does. It does. Um, and so I think if that were an issue, if I didn't have that kind of trust in my marriage, I could see where that would be difficult for some people, for sure. 
Yeah. And I check it, I check in with them. I do, you know, um, you know, like I have some clients that are in California. So sometimes they'll, you know, they'll message me at like nine, their times with like midnight, I'm on the East coast, my time. And he's like, you know, and I was like, you know, it's a, it's a client. It's okay. And he's like, all right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, you know, you know like the, it, that could, that could easily get sticky. Right. Cause you know, it's a client. But, you know, mm -hmm. your client's also hitting you up at 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. And usually at that time, we're sending a different type of text, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, and, and, I, and I asked you that because, you know, I think, you know, um, you know, I, as a, you know, as a, as somebody who has studied psychology for a while, um, you know, I sometimes find myself uh, like studying people, right? Mm -hmm. so I could only imagine if I was a sex coach. I would definitely be like analyzing my sex life from top to bottom. Like, you know, like that, that would be, that would, that would be me. That would be me for sure. Like I know that for a fact. Now yeah. um, let's talk about, you know, some of these uh, myths about uh, female sexuality. And, um, and then I'm going to have some, some of them that I've written down because I've thought of them and some of them I know the answer to, but I'm still going to ask them because I know that a lot of people might have those as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the number one thing that I speak about that is still such a huge issue is female orgasm. That is by far the most misunderstood, <laughs> um, just it, people are still like, I'll give you a perfect example. So, and this is not just from men, this is women who still don't understand how their own orgasm works because we're, plastered with porn and even just the memes that are, are driving home this false information about how we orgasm. So um, I had a woman recently, married, kids, well-educated, messaged me and said, I need, I need to coach with you. I think there's something wrong with me. I'm like, not granted, I hear that 55 times a day. And I know the answer is, no, there's nothing wrong with you. Whatever you're going to tell me, you're fine, right? So she says, something's really wrong. I've been to a sex therapist and it's still not fixed. But these were her words, right? So she's broken and needs fixing. So I said, all right, lay it on me. Like I've heard pretty much everything. everything. And she said, I cannot come from sex. Oh my God. I have a question right after this. Keep on going. So I said, wait, so where's, where's the problem? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure what like sex as in penetration alone. She said, yes. Like, I'm not one of those women who can just come from, from penetration. And I said, uh, still not seeing the issue here. Like, we, we don't. Um, no, 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 can you clarify me why there isn't an issue there? Okay. So the majority of women, if, and when I say women, I mean people with a vagina, okay? So the majority of women can only orgasm through clitoral stimulation, right? Mm, so interesting. E even the small amount of women, which is 15 to 20% max, that say, yes, I can come just from penetration alone, researchers are still saying, yeah, but your, your clitoris is not just what you see on the outside. So that's something that I'm still teaching adults, right? So it's not something that should be expected that everybody knows. So everyone always thinks that the clit is just that little tiny thing that you see outside on the vulva, right? No, that is like a fraction of it. Your clit actually looks like this, right? So you have this right here is the part that you see. And then you have like legs, that come actually behind the labias. And this is the vaginal opening right here. So you literally, if you can see my amazing artwork here, yeah. you literally very have- visual. Very visual. Right? I was, I was also a former health teacher. So this is just how I, this is how I roll, right? <laughs> so you have the clit is actually a large organ. You're only seeing like a fifth of it out here. The rest is inside and it actually surrounds the vaginal opening. So even the women that are like, yes, I can come just from penetration alone. You're actually, if the penis is going in and out here, the clitoral legs are still being stimulated. It's nowhere near as sensitive as this, but the legs are still being stimulated. Question. So, yeah. Now, you know, these, these, these legs that you speak of, right? Um, are, they're inside? Inside, correct? behind the labia. Hmm? Behind the labia. So would you, would you say that these are more like the nerves that are connected to the clitoris that we see? 
on the outside? So the whole thing is, is all interconnected, but the, there's about 8,000 nerve endings in the clitoris. So if you look at how it's, and I was just talking to a guy about this today. We all anatomically start as females in the womb. Yes. Even, even guys, right? Till about five to seven weeks-ish, when if there is a Y chromosome, it kicks in. But by that time, that's why we all have nipples because we're all start as female. And then what happens is if the Y chromosome doesn't kick in, if you don't have a Y and you're not a boy or like a you know male gender, then breast tissue starts to develop and you're you're you know a girl, biologically a girl. The penis is literally made up of the same tissue as the clitoris. So if you think about it this way, if you have an enlarged clitoris, it becomes the shaft and the head of a penis. The legs of the clitoris, that, or, or I'm sorry, the, the, um, the legs of the clitoris are actually called the cor corpus cavernosa, with the penis also has, like the spongy tissue along the shaft. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the labia uh, on the outside of the vulva is actually the same for kind of tissue for, for your sac. Yeah. So if you think about it, think about how sensitive your entire penis is or the head of your penis and the size of that. If you shrink down your head of the penis into the size of a clit, the, 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 the head of the clit, that we're talking like that's how concentrated it is, right? So, so, when we, so that, there's one thing, right? So the internal walls of your vagina have very few nerve endings where literally some, you can actually do minor, 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 minor surgery on inside your vaginal walls without anesthesia like there's really not a lot of nerves on the vaginal walls interesting what, yeah so what feels good during penetration is t penetration alone i'm not talking if the if the girl is using her hand on her clit i'm not talking if she's using a vibrator if the guy's pelvis is rubbing against, against her clit take all that away if you're just talking penetration what can feel good is the, um, there's actually a couple spots inside, but one is the G spot that most of us have heard of, even though it's not really a spot, it's kind of like an area, right? right. So yes. it's about two to three inches inside the vagina. So when you go in and you hook your fingers, it's right around there. So if the penis is hitting that, that can feel good. There's a, a really nice sensation for, for most women, not all. Some women don't like that feeling at all. It kind of feels pressure, almost like the pressure you feel like, like when you have to pee, um, cause your bladder is also there too, but it can feel really good. And I think a lot of women who do not, um, who that's why women can still really enjoy sex and not orgasm from it. It still feels good. Oh my God. You're going into some of the questions that I'm asking. You keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> it still feels really good. Um, and you know, so, and the other thing is sex research for the most part is self-reported, which means a survey goes out and people answer it. Right. So the word orgasm means I'm associating it with a certain feeling for me. But another woman next to me might think of something totally different. And that's happened to me before when I go, I'm talking to a woman and she's like, oh, I come all the time from penetration. I'm like, okay. And I said, well, what about clitoral? Oh yeah, that too, but it's a totally different feeling. So I'm like, okay, so you're literally using the word orgasm for two different things. So, okay, so now let's go into one of, this is not, this wasn't, this is not a written down uh, question, but this is because I just thought about this, right? So I don't know where I read this and I'm not sure if it's true, but there was this different types of orgasms, right? And, and, and I'm like, right, there's the clitoral, there's the penetration one, and what was the other one? And then there was the, um, the body one right the so, whole body. yeah so there's one with your entire body though i guess that would be the shaking the the curling your back type of orgasm there would be the the clitoral one where you just orgasm because of the clitoral and then the one that you receive a penetration i ask you this right because um i had bumped into someone who said that oh i don't come right it's just it's i, I enjoy sex but i don't come right but her body fluids we're telling me something different. So now, I mean, I know there's a lot of questions here that I'm throwing at you at once, but, but you know, how do you, how do you, how do you classify like this is an orgasm or is there different type of orgasms or I don't know what else to ask. <laughs> okay. So, um, that's a really good question. And I, and so there's, 
uh, this has all to do with myths as well, right? So vaginal lubrication is not necessarily indicative of how turned on somebody is or not. Like you can be completely dry. So wait, you're telling me that, whoa, 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 whoa. Yo, Nina, Nina, I don't, I don't think you understood what you just did there. You're, you're, you're about to like defy like all laws of men's like life right now. Um, what you're saying is that vaginal fluid does not indicate how turned on a woman is. Not necessarily, correct. Explain this because this is not what I've been told my entire life. Yep. So here's the thing. Vaginas are self-cleaning, okay? So we have lubrication to protect it and keep it clean, right? So if you ever, if you actually never even used soap on your vagina, if you just used warm water, like, you know, just to clean it out, you're okay. Um, so a vagina is self-cleaning, number one. Two, think about, um, think about as women get older and our hormones change, we tend to be very dry down there. It doesn't mean we're never turned on. It's just, it's a hormonal thing. So vaginal lubrication or dryness can be affected by where you are in your menstrual cycle, medication, stress, hormones, right? So it's not, I'm not saying that women, um, that women who get turned on aren't, don't get wet. Of course they do, but it's also possible if they're not super wet, that they are still turned on. And it's also possible that if they're, you know, if they're wet down there, that it could literally just be natural lubrication. So I, it's almost like, I want to say this to help men and women and tell you that if she's not that wet down there, it doesn't necessarily mean she's not turned on. You know, it's like, there are times where a woman's nipples can be hard. It doesn't mean she's turned on. She could be cold. She could, she could have it rub up against her bra. Like, so I think people put so much pressure on physiological reactions to let your partner know whether or not you're like ready or not. I mean, think there's, I'm not saying that if she's wet, she's not turned on. I'm saying that it's absolutely possible that she is wet down there just because that her lubrication is just helping her vagina stay healthy. Um, but typically, if a girl is not wet down there, it doesn't necessarily mean she's not turned on. It's just so I don't want guys to go down and be like, she's not even wet, she's not even turned on. That's not necessarily true at all. It could be medication, hormones, stress, just the way her body works. So it is not an all or nothing thing, is what I'm saying. Okay. You, um, all right. Gentlemen, I guess we're going to reevaluate how we look at things from now on. Um, now, now, Nina, you know, what, what, what's another common myth uh, of the female sexuality? Um, that another one is that women um, always, all women want monogamy. You know, it's like when people say, oh, men like variety and excitement and women we we really just enjoy that emotional sexual bond with one person and that's false i hate to break it to you <laughs> so no, go ahead I have, a, I have a question right about this monogamy thing right um mm -hmm. so you know i i have a friend who she um she 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 confessed this to me just i guess cuz i'm also like i guess the the one who has the open mind and yeah I, yeah yeah right um you know she's like yo i you know i've always wanted to have a threesome but i want to have a threesome with two guys i don't want to have a threesome with like another girl right mm -hmm. and she was like but it's so difficult for me to say because i'm a female right so you know does does that bring in some sort of like uh society's pressure to you know to conduct themselves a certain way and to want things a certain way i guess to give this portrayal of this is what a female is 100 percent, 100 percent. so it's always we can joke about men wanting multiple women, right? And this goes back um, in our culture, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, you have monogamy really, monogamy is not biological. So let me just say that first. Humans are not biologically designed to be monogamous. It's quite the opposite. There are actually very few mammal species that were designed to be monogamous and humans are not one of them. So monogamy is a choice. Every second of every minute of every day is a choice. It's a conscious choice. So um, women 
way, way back in the day when monogamy was like, okay, only, you know, men can be with multiple women, right? They have their harem, they have the concubines, they can, they're studs, and it meant you were rich and, and powerful if you had a lot of women. But women were only allowed to be with one man. And the reason for that was that they didn't have paternity tests, you know, back then. So the only way the guy would know who to pass on his property and, and money to was if he knew who his children, usually who his son was, you know, but usually who his children were. So if I'm having sex with multiple men and I get pregnant, nobody knows whose baby that is. So who's the guys that I'm sleeping with are kind of like, well, is that mine? Because if it is, I need to know so I can pass my, my stuff down to him when I go. Now, humans have evolved and technology has evolved. It's very easy to find out who the dad is now, but between religion and societal constructs that happened, you know, centuries ago, women are still living that antiquated, you know, societal role of being these pure, innocent, monogamy loving, stay at home mom wanting kind of a person. When, you know, if I were to say, oh yeah, I would love multiple men, all of a sudden I'm a slut, right? Or I'm really promiscuous or my self-respect, you must have daddy issues, right? But a guy that says, oh, I'd love to be with multiple women, people are like, oh yeah, you're a guy, of course you would. So there's this massive double standard when it comes to sexuality. And um, Dr. Wednesday Martin, who's an amazing researcher, um, she published a book called Untrue, and it's all about sex myths and monogamy about women. And one of the things they found was that women actually get bored with monogamy sooner than men. So, and I speak so often. <laughs> right? Hold on, hold on, time out, time out, time out, time out. Nina, you can't just drop this bomb on us. <laughs> so wait, you're, you're telling me that women get, oh, what? I, don't even, I can't even speak. Um, so women get tired of monogamy faster than men. How, how, why, who said this? How'd they come up with this? Okay, so it was just, again, just any kind of research that was done. She wrote this whole book about it. And here's, here's another way to look at it. When you look at relationships, long-term relationships, heterosexual long-term relationships, you'll often find that the guy, not always, but often, you'll find that the guy is complaining about the girl who lost her sex drive. Okay. Let me, True. Before, before you go there, because that's my, <laughs> that's my third point, right? Do women, mm -hmm. do women lose interest in sex after they've been married for a few years? Because that's another myth that's out there. So, right. So, that. and to that is what I was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Um, and I, I make a joke, and this is a joke, but kind of based on truth. I, and I don't mean to simplify men because you're not as simple as society makes you out to be. Okay, let me just put that out there. But men typically are really happy just getting it. They're like, look, you have sex with me or you go down on me and I, I can get off. Like, I'm a happy dude. Like, you know, full stomach, empty balls, right? Okay. Sounds, so, sounds about right. <laughs> right? Okay. So women can can have sex with their husband and still be like not in the mood or kind of bored or you know and actually like the last three female clients i had reached out to me because they were looking to open up their marriage not the husband the wife was mm -hmm. looking to open up the marriage if they, if they need any candidates feel free to send them my <laughs> <laughs> right totally <laughs> and actually on that note you know what else is is I don't think it's maybe it's gaining popularity because people are talking about it more, but wife sharing and hot wifing. Have you heard of that? I, okay. So I don't know too much info on it, but please enlighten me. Please enlighten me. <laughs> because this is where you could come in. This is where, this is where you could play a really big part. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so I've spoken to, to many men who are super turned on by the idea of watching their female partner with another man. And some guys are like, what? You know, they get all like territorial and like, you know, oh my God. But here's the psychology behind it, right? Because sex is like 90, not like 90 percent psychology and 10 percent how to communicate about it. That, that's really what sexuality is. So when 
there's something called the Madonna whore complex. And that basically is saying that often women are looked at as either like Madonna, like pure and not Madonna, like the singer, like Madonna, like religious Madonna, right? So like really pure and innocent, or she's a whore. That's the Madonna whore complex. When when people are together for a long time, if a guy and girl are together for a long time, especially if they have children, sometimes men have a hard time viewing their wives as the whore that they want to be super sexual with because they kind of put her on a pedestal, which she totally deserves, but you can be both, right? So the Madonna whore complex is this psychological thing that that's why when people think of moms being sexual, they're like, you know, I mean, there's always like the MILF fantasy, which I'm totally pro MILFs, right? Like rock on. But um, it's like once you're a mom, you kind of have to like toss in your your it's sexuality. Hat. What's that? Like your, your sexuality towel. Like I got to toss it in now. I got to be a mom. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, um, how do you think my kids got here? Right. So like, so <clears throat> what happens is when the man is able to see his wife or female partner in a different light like almost like looking at it from the outside seeing her seeing her for the pure sexual being that she is it completely triggers this like like that's that's who i remember like that is what i remember you know like it's like in the beginning you get like butterflies in your stomach and you guys are like rabbits and then over time reality is a huge orgasm blocker it really is um so by seeing each other out of that normal, you know, sexual space can be a super huge turn on for people. So, and I know women that are like, I would love to just watch my husband take another woman just to see him in that like pure masculine raw energy. Like it goes both ways. So there's cuckolding which is the same is when a, a man likes to see another man with his wife and there's cuckqueening when the woman likes to see her man with another woman. All right, so what, see, can you pronounce it one more time? What so cuckolding, so C-U-C-K. Cuck, so cuck, like, okay, so the word comes from the cuckoo bird okay. because cuckoo birds, um, they lay eggs in other birds' baskets or baskets, nests. <laughs> they don't have baskets, right? That's a, that's a, that's a dope analogy though. Right, so... And, and actually, in modern day, sometimes men who are raising children that are not bio biologically their own are called cucks. So oh, that, that's, what's that? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm cool with stepdad. I'm, I'm, right. <laughs> you're right. So it's basically like you're raising somebody else's kid, right? So your girl was with another guy and you're raising their kid. So that sometimes they can be called that. But so cuck, oh, not cuck holding cuck holding so c-u-c-k-o-l-d-i-n-g okay. and then cuck, yep and then cuck queening like queen but i believe it's actually spelled q-u-e-a-n-i-n-g which is interesting but yes cuck holding and cuck queening um hot wife or hot wifing or wife sharing are other terms involved too um and it's really up to the guy to decide what role he wants to play because different men like to play a different role in watching their wife. So it could literally be him just sitting back and either pleasing himself and watching or um, some men like to be humiliated. So that could be his wife while, while she's having sex with another guy is, t is saying out loud to her husband how much better or bigger he is um, so yeah, so some men like to be humiliated and a lot of that is because it goes against societal norms. Men are supposed to be masculine and territorial of their woman. And so going against all societal norms can be really arousing for a lot of people. Wow. This, yeah, listen, we, we just started and we're learning a lot here. <laughs> all right. So, um, let's go to the, uh, to the next one. Um, vaginal lubrication is an equivalent of an erection. Is that a myth or is that a fact? Yeah, I'm going to say more of a myth than a fact. More than a myth than a fact? Yeah. I'm not, not saying it, it can it be factual. Absolutely. 
Um, but all the time, no, for the reasons I, I mentioned earlier. Now, this is, and this is, uh, this is one of my personal uh, um, analogies, right? You know, I think, you know, and I guess, I, I mean, for, based off what you said, it kind of like defeats, defeats what I'm saying. But like women who overthink a lot struggle more with orgasm. Is that a fact or is that a myth? That is a 350,000% fact. <laughs> okay. Then I'm not. Yeah. Now, now, ex- now ex- explain to me, how would you, how would you coach um, someone who's an overthinker to kind of like sit back and relax and I guess enjoy the moment? Yeah. So um, I'm one of those. I'm one of those women. And most women are like that. So um what I tell people, like I'm a very outside the box coach, right? I'm not looking, I don't believe anybody is broken. I don't look to fix people. I look to show people how to love and own where they are right now and navigate their life with what they have. So here's a, here's a perfect example. Women are taught in our society to be the pleasers, right? We're only a good lover if we're good to the guy, if we want to please, right? Um, And so we are literally taught to be performers in the bedroom. So we, it's hard for us to feel desirable if we're just sitting back and, and receiving pleasure in whatever way, because oftentimes we're like, you know, of course we have body image issues, a lot of us. So it's like, oh my God, what do I look like? What do I smell like? What do I taste like? Like if there's all that shit going on. Oh, um, and the- <laughs> like, why? Like, like, why? Like, this is, okay, this is my thing, right? Like if we've gotten to the point, right, that you are in my bedroom and we both are, don't have clothes that I am more than positive. Uh, and you know what? And maybe this is just me. I'll generalize. This is me, right? I am not thinking, oh, you know what? She doesn't physically, nah, she doesn't look that good. Like what? Like, why would you think that that's a thought? Like, you know what I mean? Like why? Because of society. I mean, look at social media. There's how many times have you, and maybe you don't surround yourself with people like this, but how many times have you seen memes about what a girl's, labia looks like oh yeah or or smells like right the whole arby's thing fish tacos like right you've seen it all right very rarely will you see women or even our society joking about how ball sacks look like chicken skin all right we don't talk about that because we know we know what it feels like to to feel horrible about our bodies because that's it's it's you know like people talk about uh, you know, there's all these memes like this is her, you know, when she's younger and then this is what it looks like when she's been with 10 guys and it's like all like some roast beef hanging out of a sandwich. Like, so, Jesus. So to, to go off of that, right, you know, does the size of the labia indicate anything to do with the amount or the how large of a penis a girl has received? No. No, and I'm gonna I'm gonna prove it to you. So when people talk about, um, oh, she's been with a lot of guys, she's really loose. Like her vagina must be like like this, right? Nobody says that about people who are married. And trust me, people who are married probably ha- like if I'm having sex consistently for the last 15 years of my life, versus one girl who has sex with 10 guys in one night wouldn't wouldn't i wouldn't you assume my vagina would be looser it's a valid point there right and it isn't our vagina okay again not to burst anybody's penis bubble here but our bodies are designed to deliver a baby (laughs) right so if a baby's head is this big all right i'd love to meet a man that has this big of of a penis right but if it's if our cervix has to dilate 10 centimeters to even be able to, to get, our bodies are designed to bounce back. Otherwise we'd have a baby and we'd be like this. Our vaginas would be like a, a cavernous, like Grand Canyon for the rest of our lives. That is a myth. That is a myth. Our, again, nobody jokes about people who are married. And yes, married people have sex, believe it or not. So if a girl goes out and has sex over a week with 50 people, that's sex 50 times. I've had sex more than 50 times with one person. Then in that case, you should think that my vagina is like this big black hole. And it's not. So no, that is not true. 
All right. So here's another one, right? Um, there's a 10 year difference between a woman and a men's sexual peak. Um, pretty accurate. Women tend to hit their peak late thirties, early forties. Um, what, what, and why is that? I don't know if it's a hormonal thing. Uh, I don't know the clinical aspect, but I can tell you that a lot of it is, is our heads. So as we get older, I think we kind of let more stuff go. Um, and I also think that society doesn't um, give us as hard of a time being sexual when we're, when we're older. So like if I'm, you know, 20 and I'm, I'm having a good time, I could be called a slut or, you know, if I'm 40, and I'm dating and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like an adult, like I have, you know, I can make my own decisions. And, and the, a lot of those labels kind of fall off. So I think it's a combination of a few things, being comfortable with who we are um, and what our body, even though our bodies tend to look not as, you know, Instagram worthy as they did when we were 18, but you know, you know what I mean? But like, absolutely. Like I own my body now more than I did when I was 18 for sure. And I don't look anything like I did when I was 18. Like I want to kick myself in the ass for thinking that I was like, I mean, I look at my body, I was 18 that I complained about. I would do anything to have that body back. But now after having two kids, right. And pushing 40. Yeah. My body doesn't look the same, but I own my sexuality a lot more now. I know like just as a lover, I'm just better now than I was when I was 18. So I think between societal pressure kind of waning and you're kind of building more confidence in your, um, in your body and what it needs and how to speak up for it. I think that probably plays a larger role. All right. Um, I have like two more, um, but then this one, is, this one is uh, one that I'm actually very interested in. Um, every girl can score. Can you explain? Okay, so now you know before we dive, before we dive into the entire thing, right? So first, you know, can every girl squirt? Is squirt pee because it's the big debate? You know whether people think it's pee or not. Uh, I think I saw a research that said it was pee, but I'll let you handle this. Anyways, um, and 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 you know what what is the what is the muscle that causes um I guess uh, a girl to have the more the projectile type of squirting. So can I tell you that last night I did um, a live show on, on my, uh, on one of my live shows and this question came up and I was like, like I'd already been on for like an hour and a half. I'm like, I can't get into squirting right now. Cause I, <laughs> like, it's gonna, it's gonna be an episode in and of itself, but I'm going to try to be as, <laughs> as like succinct as I possibly can. The research that you read out there is conflicting. Okay, so I'm just gonna say that. I can find research that says like, it's mostly urine because you're really hitting uh, an area in the body that is very close to the bladder. Um, there has been research that has taken the fluid that has come out and tested it and there's other stuff besides urine in there. That's true, that's true. Um, but the other issue is people look at female ejaculation and squirting as two different things. So here's, here's, here's the, the problem with talking about sex research in and of itself is that it's self-reported and people are using the same words for different things. Like when someone says orgasm, I know what I think about. To me personally, that comes from clitoral stimulation and there's this buildup of pressure. And then I like totally go into full body spasms and like, I can't breathe or like I have like an exorcism. Right. So that to me is what's most analogous to a guy's orgasm. So like when I, if I, my husband orgasms, I feel like I know what that feels like. Like my body kind of responds the way that his does, but people are like, Oh, the G spot orgasm or the vaginal orgasm. I'm like, okay, but what are you really referring to? Just a really good feeling that it's like a buildup of pressure. Like, I don't even know what that is. I really don't. <laughs> because when I think of orgasm, I think of like clitoral. So I don't, I think people talk about different things using the same word. My personal opinion, and that's all this is. Okay. So please, <laughs> please just understand that. Okay. This is just Joe Schmo Nina's opinion. 
I think that when we talk about squirting, I think of when this is how it usually happens. Now, if you're going by porn, I'm not going to like demonstrate, but if you're going by porn, don't because they actually will often put um, water up their vagina, right? Like their actual vagina because they can't put up their urethra, right? So that is something, let's just take porn out of it, okay? The only thing that I know personally about squirting, if that's what you first phrase you want to use, is that if you go into a vagina, right, and hook your fingers up, instead of like going in and out like that, if you like, it's almost like pulling like up, a like, a like a hook, but you're pulling up really fast, okay? When you pull up fast and hard, you're essentially stimulating the G-spot area and the bladder. The bladder is right there, okay? So that sensation of, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pee, I'm gonna pee, I'm gonna pee. And everyone's like, well, you're gonna feel like you have to pee, but just push through it. Like, don't be nervous, just put... That's because a lot of what's coming out of me is freaking pee. Like that <laughs> is a lot of what's coming out. Is, have I ever tested it like in a Petri dish? No, I haven't. But I know my body. Um, and a lot of the women I've spoken to that have tried that are like, yeah, I'm pretty sure a lot of it is pee. Um, but are there... Is there other stuff in there? Probably, because there's other stuff in our bodies. But I, this is just an opinion. I personally think that a lot of it is urine. All right. So, so we can conclude that if done properly and the person is, uh, I guess, relaxed enough, then quote unquote, under the, the terminology of squirting, every, every, every girl is possible, uh, can do this. I think there's a possibility, um, yes. I think it is possible for, for most women to be able to do it. Um, I don't think that it's something that every woman should sit there and lose sleep over and strive to do. And I think that's where like media is like commercializing women's orgasms, like the nipplegasm, the vaginal orgasm, the the clitoral orgasm. I'm like, okay, whoa, Susan, calm down with the 55 orgasms. Like women have a hard enough time achieving a clitoral orgasm, which is like the OG orgasm. Like that's really the, the only organ in our body that, that creates an orgasm that like the textbooks talk about. All the other types of orgasms, I think are just, um, amazing buildup of feelings and there might be pressure and a release of pressure. That's possible. Um, I think girls can feel that first from squirting. There's like a buildup of pressure and then it does feel like that sensation. Of What's that? The sense of relief. After. Yeah. Yeah. But that feels completely different than a clitoral orgasm. Like they're two different feelings. All right. Now, last but not least, right. Um, the penis size, right? Um, a penis needs to be large in order for your partner to be satisfied um, in, this, in the sexual encounter. Um, let's talk what's the, what's the average, right? And, what, and what's, the, what's the size needed to make a woman, I guess, enjoy? I don't, don't want to say orgasm yet because I guess yeah, yeah. it's a debatable thing right there. Um, yeah. So what, what would that look like and what, and what is that? So the average penis size is between five and a half and six, six and a half ish, um, hard. That's average. I would say five and a half to six is, is average. Um, does penis size matter? I'm going to say it, it, yes, it matters, but I don't want people to take that as large penises matter. I don't, because that's not what I mean. I do mean that in order for, um, and it's going to depend on the woman's vagina size, like how deep her vagina is. Some women's are, are more are more shallow, um, but also when women are aroused, our vagina actually increases in size. So depth, it increases. So you can take more, right? Um, this is interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so wait, wait. So what you're saying is that 
the more aroused the women in, and not all, but some, right? Their death gets larger. Yep. yep. Wow. How does that? How does that? How does that work? So a lot of it is really based on the 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 reproductive, the biological piece. So they want your vagina wants to be able to accommodate a penis for reproduction. So our bodies are kind of made that way. Um, and uh, the other thing is there's something called the tenting effect. So when a woman orgasms and her, her pelvic muscles, everything is spasming, your uterus actually lifts a little, almost like a tent. Um, and that is to accommodate the penis. So there, so there's, if you look up the tenting effect, that's, so there are some biological things that happen inside of a woman specifically, evolutionarily speaking for reproduction, not pleasure, but just reproduction. Um, penis size matters when, um, if, if a woman like enjoys the feeling of G spot, you know, stimulation or, or some women like, um, the area by your cervix, <clears throat> um, right next to your cervix is called the A spot, which is called your anterior fornix. And that's like how, um, that's why some women who receive anal sex, it, sometimes it can push on that spot. It's almost like they call it the female prostate right? So like, if you go deep enough, you, in certain positions, you can hit that spot too. It almost feels like it's half in your vagina, half in your butt, kind of, and it feels good. Some women like to, some women like the feeling of the cervical hit, you know? Um, so it really depends on the person you're with. So yes, if you have a micro penis, and that's actually a medical term. So when, when I say micro penis, it isn't like I'm trashing a guy's penis size. That's actually the medical term. A micro penis usually means something like, I think it's under three and a half inches erect or something like that. It's really it's very, very small. And if that's the case, correct, a woman probably won't receive stimulation inside where she desires it. However, even with that, there are so many toys that you can use um, penis extenders, things like that, that, that will be able to, to do what you need it to do. Um, if you're too big, penetration can be painful. Oral sex can be a chore, right? So I also don't want people to go, oh, like, I'm automatically awesome if I have a huge penis. Like, there's only so much we can do with a huge penis. Like, just like there's only so much we can do with a small one, right? I mean, like, let's be real. I don't, if I'm going to give really good oral on a 13 inch thing, like, ow, like, I don't, what am I, I don't like, what am I going to just, I guess I'm just going to play with the head of it. I like, what can I really do? <laughs> yeah. now, you know, you, you brought up, you brought up the toys and, um, and I remember I just recently, I made a comment um on this and I probably should have asked you before I made this comment, but you know. Does a woman who use um, toy make it harder for them to climax or orgasm when they're having sex with a, with a partner? Nope. Nope. Um, because like I said, the penetration means very little when we're talking about female orgasm. So a lot of, I will say that a lot of women who use a vibrator during sex, um, they, some women, when they say, oh yeah, I come from sex all the time, could mean that either they're somehow their clit's being stimulated during penetration and they're not separating the two acts. They're just saying, yes, when I have sex, I have an orgasm. Well, how? Because that can mean a million different things, right? So if I'm using a vibrator during penetration, yeah, I can get off too but I'm not going to get off just from penetration. So I think that's kind of a, a miscommunication often too. But the only thing I would say is that if using a vibrator um, on your own, which most women, when they masturbate, they'll use a vibrator. But if, if that becomes a problem where maybe they once were able to orgasm with a partner, um, maybe like by using their hand or something and now they can't because they're, they can, they're like so dependent on the vibrator. First of all, that in and of itself is not a problem. So what? So you're dependent on a vibrator. There's, everybody has their own orgasm formula, right? And our bodies change as we get older. So, so what? So like, that's like saying, oh, to a, it's like nobody would say that to a guy. We wouldn't say, hey, you can only come from sex. Like you got to switch that up. Nobody would say that to a guy, right? But when it comes to girls' orgasms, all of a sudden now we're told, okay, finally you find something that works, but don't do it often because that could, that could mess you up too. 
right? Like that's backwards. That sounds crazy. Right. We would never say that to a guy. We would never, nobody would ever say, oh, you could only come from penetration. You might want to switch it up and do other stuff just in case it becomes hard for you to come in other ways. No, you'd be like, well, if I'm coming from sex, why do I just keep having sex? Well, if I come from a vibrator, why do I just keep using the vibrator? Um, but no, the only thing I would say though, is if, if you're noticing, um, like if for, if for any reason you want to be able to come without a vibrator, I would say, okay, then stop using a vibrator for a while and kind of get back to using your hand and I think, or, or his mouth or something. But I think that it might take longer and that's something that just expect, right? I mean, statistically, the only orgasm gap that exists is between men and women. So um, usually for every one orgasm a woman has, men have three. Right. So men are orgasm three times as much in heterosexual sexual activity than women. That's a massive gap. It doesn't really exist in lesbian relationships. It doesn't exist in gay relationships. And it's and even with bi women, um, it's still not really an issue. The orgasm gap is only an issue and a big one in a in heterosexual relationships. And it's usually because of well, obviously our mental state, right? Our heads get very loud when we bring somebody into the picture and also physically. So the mechanics of how we get off aren't as straightforward maybe as like a guy's, a guy's way to get off. Um, Nina, um, last, this is the last one before we get out of here, right? Um, how, would you, how do you become a sex coach? Because I'm actually interested in this. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there's so many ways. Um, I, there's online courses, um, and depending on what kind of coach you want to be, um, some people get into the tantric sex coaching, some get into somatic sex. Co I mean, there's all different kinds. Uh, I will say personally that the reason why I got an actual certification it isn't that I learned necessarily so much more. I mean, I've been passionate about sexuality and, and mental health forever. It's that I know the psychology behind telling somebody, yes, I'm a certified sex coach versus I'm just passionate about sexuality and I can help you. You know what I mean? Like I don't, there are online courses you can take. Um, that's what I did. And I did it really for more for, you know, staying, staying relevant. And, and being able to reassure someone that, yes, because unfortunately that, that matters to people. For sure, for sure it does. All right, yeah. Nina, um, where can we find you? Um, uh, and, uh, and if we have any questions for you, where can we reach? Yeah, so um, on Facebook, you can reach me at Real Talk with Nina is my business page. Um, on Instagram, it's Nina Real Talk, all one word on Instagram. My YouTube channel is just Real Talk with Nina. My website is realtalkwithnina.com. And you can actually submit uh, anonymous sex questions or relationship questions or mental health questions right on my website. And I go online uh, usually once a week um, where I'll have a guest on talking about something related to sex or mental health. And also I do live Q&A. So like last night, that's what I was doing is I was answering a bunch of anonymous questions that had come in. So that is where you can find me. All right. Um, Alice Cruz Negro's party. Once again, I brought you the speaker, the writer, the mental health and sexuality coach, Nina. Nina, thank you for being here. And, um, and well, we're going to stay in touch because <laughs> this is just going to be the first one of many. This is going to be the first episode of many. We're just, you know just going to make a podcast, just me and you together. But because <laughs> Done. I, I have, I, oh my God, I have so many more. I have so many, 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 many more questions. All right. Um, I was going to go to Negro's party. Um, and don't forget to check out the next episode.